more of Sally Denton's The Bluegrass Conspiracy, copyrighted in 1990, uh, about Drew Thornton's parachute jump with $75 million of cocaine and a, a, a drug trade gone bad. So, the prologue. Ralph Ross was possibly the least surprised of anybody uh, at Drew Thornton's absurd death. To say that Ralph was happy about it might be going too far, but he did feel that the son of a bitch finally got what he deserved. Ordinarily, Ralph's mornings got off to a late start. Ever since he had retired, been forced out, was more, what, more like it. Ralph dawdled over his newspaper and coffee, still hadn't adjusted to his life as an ostracized cop. Since his conviction three years earlier for illegal wiretapping, Ralph Ross greeted most days like an empty canvas of white space. A 52-year-old man with nothing to do was a sorry sight in Ralph's opinion, so he took his daily routine serious, as if his life would collapse without that semblance of structure, measly though it was. Sooner or later, though, he would find himself alone with a tenacious mind that refused to forget anything. From noon on, Ralph spent most waking hours cursing Drew Thornton, just another darn blue blood putting on airs. Ralph had thought upon first meeting Drew a decade and a half earlier. Ralph's initial instincts would prove accurate. In the end, Drew Thornton would, fight, would be fatally hurled, hurled to earth, overburdened by his superiority complex and mythical self-perception. When the phone rang at the crack of dawn on September 11th, Ralph roused himself from a deep sleep. September 11, 1985. Drew's dead, the voice said. Though the caller didn't identify himself, Ralph recognized him as an informant from past police work. He slammed into the ground in Knoxville when his parachute didn't open. At dawn, I was driving north on Interstate 75 back to Lexington, Ralph's source continued. Drew's friend, Rebecca Sharp, sped past me in a black stretch limousine with chemically darkened windows. He had somebody with her. She had somebody with her, but I didn't get a look at him. So began the denouement of the dramatic odyssey that began in 1970 when Ralph Ross and Drew Thornton embarked on their collision course. Ralph recognized Drew's last jump as a climax before the resolution. Finally, the promise of a just conclusion to years of deadly conflict seemed imminent. Throughout the 1970s and early 1980s, the trails of Ralph and Drew had zigzagged across each other's territory. Both were Kentucky natives, one rich and one poor. But their backgrounds were not as dissimilar as their outcomes would later suggest, nor were their motivations and personality traits as polarized. Both were warriors, trained by the elite forces of the U.S. military. Both had entered manhood through combat in America's lesser wars, one in Korea, the other in the Caribbean. Uh, the Caribbean or the Caribbean, both men. Yeah, Caribbean or Caribbean, what some people say tomato, tomato. Have you ever heard anybody say tomato? Hey, can you give me some more tomatoes on that sandwich? Hey, where's the tomatoes at? Hey, you know, um, let's organize the tomato pickers. And nobody, nobody says tomato. So, anyways, it's tomato. It's it's tomato. It's not tomato. It's tomato. Okay. So it's also not potatoes or taters. There's no there's no taters. It's potatoes. Okay, potatoes. All right. So just just a quick English la uh, lesson, uh, English language lesson. So both men returned home to Kentucky to serve at police as cops, um, which uh, tends to attract a lot of psycho, sadistic, psychopath, uh, intimidator, oppressors, uh, people who were young and got picked on in school and who just want to uh, oppress and bully uh, everybody else. And a lot of times it's short, bald men. You ever notice that? Why are there a lot of short, bald men on the police force? Is it because they have some sort of inferiority complex from being short and bald, so they need to feel like a man by putting down in the uniform and badge and, and beating up drunks and prostitutes? Okay. Just like Drew Thornton? All right, all right. So both men returned home uh, Kentucky, the Bluegrass State, to serve as cops, one for the Lexington Police Department and the other for the Kentucky State Police. Both were trained in the most sophisticated undercover techniques of the time, attending some patience and meticulousness, and each would reply upon the skills taught him by the U.S. government to keep the other at bay. Each viewed the other as his nemesis and the obstacle to his mission. So they had beef. So uh, Ralph Edward Ross and Drew Thornton had a beef. Rebecca Sharp she sheathed her petite hands in a pair of white cotton gloves she retrieved from her handbag. 
Drew taught me to wear these when I don't want to leave fingerprints. She said in a distinguished looking older gentleman. Uh, said to the to the distinguished looking older gentleman. She recognized as Bertram Gordon and his remarkable handsome companion. Though she had never met Gordon, she had spoken with him over the telephone and had been told by Drew that Gordon was a trusted associate. He all, she also knew that Gordon had introduced Drew to the leaders of the Colombian cocaine monopoly known as the Medellin Cartel. M-E-D-E-L-L-I-N. Medellin Cartel. So, Gordon had introduced Drew Thornton. Bertram Gordon had introduced Drew Thornton to the Medellin Cartel out of Colombia. And that Drew had been living with Gordon at the Miami Jockey Club uh, in recent weeks. Rebecca fought the urge to blame Drew for bungling such a massive smuggling operation, leaving her with a labyrinthine puzzle of locating 800 pounds of cocaine strewn across thousands of acres of national forest. She had to find it and then decide what to do with it. Meanwhile, she must try and persuade the Colombians who had fronted the coke to Drew that she was not the responsible party. It did not come as a surprise then when nine days after Drew's jump, Bertram Gordon ap appeared on the scene to collect. I considered wearing a bulletproof vest, Rebecca said to Gordon. The man driving the car introduced himself as James Vincent, an American representative of the Colombians, who were anxious to make arrangements to receive payment for the $80 million worth of cocaine Drew had guaranteed he would transport safely into the hands of the cartels of American distributors. Rebecca handed Vincent a business card imprinted with the name C. Fred Parton, referring to Parton's, Parton as Drew's good friend, and implying that Parton and not she was the individual to whom their questions should be directed. So, so why does Drew Thornton have $75 million of coke jumping out of buildings, and why is it uh, profitable? Why was it profitable for Drew Thornton to be able to sell his cocaine for such an exorbitant amount of, uh, of a rate uh, of cost? Because the war on drugs, the war on drugs makes, uh, creates contraband, creates illegal substances, makes uh, uh, some objects legal and other objects not legal. And because you have the war on drugs that's going on, it increases the um, profit incentive. Okay, so the profit incentive is created uh, uh, by the war on drugs. Why did you have Al Capone's? Why do you have all the moonshiners out of Kentucky? Why is marijuana the number one cash crop in Kentucky? Because the war on drugs is total bullshit, and the war on drugs actually does the opposite of what it intends to do. It allows the police to be able to beat people up and raid houses, but it's not solving the problem. How long has the war on drugs been going on? A hundred years? Has the war worked? Has the war on drugs worked? And if it hasn't, why do we keep doing it? What's the point of it? We keep flooding our prisons uh, with a ton of people for nonviolent offenses. Uh, meanwhile, we're taking money out of education and health care and social services that we need in order to militarize uh, our state. What's the point? What, what, we're not winning anything. We're creating Drew Thorntons. We're creating the bluegrass conspiracy happen because of the war on drugs. Especially out in Eastern Kentucky, you got Operation Unite. Operation Unite, which the federal government spends a ton of money on um, in order to bust a lot of poor Kentuckians who, um, uh, if typically, um, I, I don't know, from what I've read, uh, they're decent family men. They're just like regular working class people. They're just no different than you or I. They have no job. They're unemployed. They're, they need to provide bread and sustenance to their family. So... They engage in one of the most lucrative jobs available to them. And, um, you know, if they get away with it and make good money, good for them. They're providing a, uh, an economic opportunity. They're, they're small businessmen. They're small businessmen providing a service to the community. So they're not the criminals. The criminals are the ones who kill your dogs and bust down your door and rob you and take all your money and all your stuff. Those, those are the criminals. War on drugs has failed, and it's bullshit. We need to end the war on drugs. All right, carrying on. Drew Thornton. So Rebecca Sharp handed Vincent, James Vincent, a business card imprinted with the name C. Fred Parton, referring to Parton as Drew's good friend and implying that Parton and not she was the individual to whom their questions should be directed. What happened? Vincent asked her. Rebecca had arranged for the getaway car for Drew in Knoxville, she told the men, and was waiting his arrival at a prearranged local motel. 
So Rebecca Sharp had arranged for a getaway car at uh, in Knoxville. <laughs> Um, and at a pre-arranged local motel. So she was at a motel with a getaway car waiting for Drew to get there. Waiting at various drop sites in Georgia was a ground crew who intended to truck the cocaine that was thrown out, attached to parachutes to Daytona, Florida. So Drew's throwing cocaine out over Georgia, over the Georgia forest, uh, who intended uh, to truck the cocaine that was thrown out, attached to the parachutes in Daytona, Florida. So he's throwing all these cocaine packages um, out in Georgia forest and had a ground crew that was going to pick them up um, uh, and, and send them by truck to Daytona, Florida. So this involved a ton of um, uh, people. There's a lot of people involved in Drew Thornton's escapades in his operation. So it's not just Drew Thornton. Drew Thornton died and he gets to, you know, go out like some sort of commando since like that's pretty pretty sensational. It's a pretty provocative story. $75 million, jumped out of a Cessna 404 to his death. That's pretty sensational. So, included in uh, Drew Thornton's group was David Cowboy Williams, a Kentucky native turned Atlanta real estate magnate. So, he used to be in Kentucky, went to Atlanta, and become a real estate businessman. Rebecca knew the plans had been bungled when a man claiming to be Drew's companion on the airplane appeared at the motel alone. So, and he told Rebecca that the ugly turn of events had left Drew unaccounted for. She claimed not to know the identity of this individual. With chilling detachment, Rebecca related the details of Drew's final hours as had been told to her, she said, by Drew's mysterious anonymous accomplice. The two dope transporters had left Columbia with 12 duffel bags full of cocaine on board. Upon crossing the U.S. border, they determined that they were being tracked by government aircraft. Vincent thought it odd that Rebecca specifically identified the chase planes as two Citation jets and a Black Hawk helicopter. Aircraft recently acquired by U.S. Customs to interdict, 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 interdict air smugglers because it would have been impossible to see them from the cockpit. Drew and his partner had divided nine of the bags into sets of three, she said, and attached a parachute to each set. They threw two more duffel bags out of the airplane door attached to chutes. The bags were to be retrieved by crews waiting at designated sites. When their apprehension apparently imminent, Drew then tied the last duffel bag to his body and set the plane on automatic pilot. He gave his partner a karate buff who had never parachuted a quick rundown on the chute equipment, and he pushed him out the door. Then Drew dropped out after him. Rebecca told the men that when Drew's partner arrived at the Knoxville Motel, Knoxville, Tennessee, just south of Kentucky, the two of them waited several hours for Drew to turn up. She listened to the television simultaneously hoping for and dreading news about Drew. When the 6 a.m. local news came on, she heard a report of a dead parachutist. Rebecca and Drew's accomplice then took off for Lexington, where upon her arrival, she went directly to Drew's apartment. Accompanied by Drew's younger brother, she removed all incriminating evidence. The man who identified himself as Vincent, as uh, James Vincent, impressed upon Rebecca that the Colombians were anxious to retrieve, retrieve either their coke or the money. Rebecca then assured Vincent and Burt Gordon that the situation, replete with extenuating circumstances, would be remedied under her watch. Drew's people are honorable, she said, and if they will complete the deal, they if they don't honor my promise, they know I will have them killed. So Rebecca Sharp knows that she will have her uh, accomplices in this failed drug deal killed. Rebecca Sharp, um, who was one of the point people in Drew Thornton's uh, death or uh, drug smuggling plan, drug uh, nighttime airplane drug smuggling operation. The bluegrass hills vibrated under the strong September sun as hundreds made their way past the Bourbon County gravesite. The mourners who made up a who's who of Kentucky aristocracy, a crowd of lawyers, socialites, and politicians. Thirteen floral arrangements decorated the rural cemetery, the large, largest of which was signed, I will always love you, Rebecca. So this is a huge uh, funeral. Drew Thornton had a bigger funeral than Gatewood Galbraith. One was a freedom fighter, one was a sadistic psychopath who did nothing good in his life for anybody, it seems. Uh, he just beat up people, and he karate dogs, and he was um, involved in the drug trade, so he was uh, getting all your kids hooked on coke, um, on that smack from Columbia, some Colombian smack. So, more bluegrass in a moment. 